All right. So uh, just a few quick Zoom notes uh, for those of you who have or have not done these before. We do ask generally if you aren't speaking or presenting or an interactive portion, uh, we do appreciate folks muting their microphones just so we don't get feedback or extraneous exterior noise. Uh, we're going to be having a few presenters today. So generally speaking, if you have a question as we go along, uh, we'd love for you to enter it in the chat box. Um, and we'll hopefully get to those uh, more towards the end. Uh, so feel free to type them in any time. Um, and then we'll hopefully start, have some time for those questions to go along at the end. Um, and again, if you haven't, um, we're, we're happy if you want to put your information, your name and where you're from in the chat box as well, just so we have a general idea uh, about who's here with us today. Um, and we would li like to thank you all for joining us um, in our first virtual workshop for the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance. And so I'm going to turn it over to Darlene Bialowski, who's going to talk a little bit more about CCCA. Darlene. Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Eileen. And good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our inaugural workshop. Thank you also to Eileen and Vermont Historical Society for co-sponsoring this with the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance and for um, hosting us on Zoom. And as Eileen said, my name is Darlene Bialowski, and I am a contract museum registrar and Italian decorative arts place. I live in southwest New Hampshire, but my clients... Do I hear some extraneous noise? I don't think that's on my end. Okay, that seems to be a little better. Um, I'm a contract museum registrar and a fine and decorative arts appraiser. I live in southwest New Hampshire, but my clients include museums, historical societies, cultural organizations, artists, private collectors located throughout the country. I um, have worked in the museum field for over 25 years in institutions such as the Pocumtic Valley Memorial Association in historic Deerfield, Massachusetts, as well as being the registrar for the Springfield Museums and Springfield Maps. I serve on the board of Red Arch Cultural Heritage Law and Policy Research. I'm a co-founder of the Appraisers Alliance of New England and president of the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance. The Collections Care and Conservation Alliance was formally recognized as a registered Vermont nonprofit last year. Our board is comprised of archivists, museum professionals, and conservators who live in Vermont, Eastern New York, and Western New Hampshire. The CCCA, as we commonly call it now, is a network of professionals working together to support the conservation of our region's cultural heritage, collections, and materials by way of providing information and education to individuals and entities caring for art, artifacts, historical records, and other collections. And as a network of conservation and profession, museum, prof sorry, conservation and preservation professionals, we work with cultural institutions, artists, private collectors, municipalities to help improve collections care. So I have posted in the chat box our website address. Please visit it. We would love to have you subscribe to upcoming events and news. Um, so just look at the bottom of every page on the website and you'll see a little button that asks you to subscribe. And that way you'll get updated news. Um, the tentative dates we have planned for the future will be confirmed and we'll be posting that on the website as well as giving you news through any of the subscriptions. Um, we're finalizing our membership details and those materials will be posted on the website very soon as well. So periodically check it. Earlier this year, we had planned events, including this workshop, which was originally intended to be held as an in-person event. But with COVID, of course, everything got rescheduled. So we are planning events for each of our membership categories. And if you're eligible to become a professional affiliate member, we have tentatively scheduled for July 29 as our first Conversations with Colleagues networking opportunity, which will be held at Emerald Lake State Park on the 29th, and that's located in Dorset, Vermont. A second conversation will be held October 15 at the Norwich Historical Society in Norwich, Vermont. And a third event will be um, scheduled for the northern part of Vermont sometime in the spring of 2021. We'll also be organizing other events and other workshops for all of our categories, so please be sure to watch out for those. And again, these are tentative dates that I've mentioned, so watch for confirmations in your emails or check the website as well. And I encourage you to take membership in the CCCA. I think you will find it of benefit depending upon what the work is that you're doing. And now without further delay, let me introduce you to our panel. 
all three of whom sit on the board for the CCCA. Rachel Oniff is director of the Vermont Historical Records Program, based at the Vermont State Archives, excuse me, and administration, records administration. In this role, she offers technical assistance to cultural heritage repositories throughout the site visit. Excuse me, not enough coffee this morning. In this role, she offers technical assistance to cultural heritage repositories throughout site visits and reports, workshops and trainings, and serves as an ongoing resource. In addition to the Collections Care and Conservation Alliance, she's an active member in the Vermont Arts and Culture Disaster Resilience Network, commonly known as VACDARN. Prior to her current position, she served as ruling archivist for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and director of archives for the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. She taught as an adjunct for Simmons College School of Library and Information Science and worked as an independent consultant for many years. Also joining us is Carolyn Frieza, who received her MA in paper conservation from Camberwell College of Arts in London, England in 2000. She established Works on Paper, LLC, a private pro private practice conservation studio in Southern Vermont in 2008, and specializes in conservation of artistic and historic works on paper, wallpaper, and photographs. Prior to entering private practice, Carolyn worked as an associate paper conservator at the Northeast Document Conservation Center and Tate Britain. She has been a professional associate of the American Institute for Conservation since 2007, and one of the Vermont members of the AIC National Historic National Heritage Responders since 2011. Carolyn currently serves on the board of CCCA, where she's also vice president, and is on the board of the New England Conservation Association. She's also an active member of VACDARN. And we also have Erica Donoff, a graduate of the Winner to Program in Early American Culture, has more than 20 years experience working with museums, archives, historical societies, and historic sites as an employee and consultant. She's based in Burlington and currently serves as Special Collections Director for Champlain College and manages a consulting practice specializing in curatorial, collections management, and exhibition projects. She's also on the board of the CCCA and serves as its secretary. So without further ado, let me turn the program over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Darlene, and good morning, everyone. Wonderful to see both familiar names and faces and new ones. Um, so I'm thrilled to be uh, speaking with you all this morning um, and excited too because this is this is a bit of an experiment. This is the CCCA's first virtual workshop um, and Carolyn and I are going to tag team a little bit here and see if it can seem like a natural flowing conversation a little bit um, and we'll encourage you not necessarily to jump in with questions now but to wait until we've kind of gone over the, the, the nuts and bolts of, of mold and what it is and why we should be concerned about it. Um, and then Erica is going to kind of bring all that together um, by talking about some of her her lived experience with mold. Um, and then at that point, we think we'll have we should have time for for your questions, for you to share your experiences with us, um, and and have a have a broader conversation. But as Eileen said, don't hesitate to type your 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 question into the chat. Um, we also will be able, I think, to let you unmute yourself and and speak your question if if it's too much to be if like me, you can't listen to a presentation and type in a chat box at the same time. So either way should work just fine. Um, so Carolyn, do you want to give, you know, we don't have a formal poll set up for this, but Carolyn, do you want to, to quiz people about anything at this point? Sure. Um, so what we were thinking you could do is maybe give a raise of hands if you have ever encountered mold um, in your, in your collections or your building or even in your, personal life. Um, you know, it's sort of like the time is upon us now for it to start happening, especially as we have these temperature swings and a lot of dew and moisture at night. Um, I'm definitely starting to pay more attention to it. I, I live in a historic stone schoolhouse, so we are constantly fighting moisture there at home. Um, I'm in my studio today, which is climate controlled, um, which I always appreciate being here in the summer, but um, hopefully this is not something you've all experienced, but it's, there's a good chance you have in some way. And I think, you know, we've been especially concerned um, as COVID-19 has made a lot of um, buildings and museums be closed or have a lot less um, frequent 
and habitation. Um, that we're a little extra concerned this year is as that people get back into their buildings, um, they really need to be aware of, of how to check and make sure they don't have a mold outbreak that's about to occur or is in, in process. How do I raise my hand? Hi, Tom. <laughs> you got to turn on your video or, or make it do a thumbs up sign or something. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was muted. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and we can talk at the end, too, you know, if you have um, specific experiences that you want to ask us about. Um, there should be plenty of time to do that as well. Um, so I guess without, without further ado, I'll sort of jump in here to our our presentation. I'm, I'm hoping you can all hear me. Um, my dehumidifier is not the quietest, but not the loudest. So hopefully it's not, not coming through my audio. But I want to start off by sort of just very briefly talking about what, what is mold. Um, so mold is part of the kingdom fungi, which includes yeast, mushrooms, and filamentous fungi. What we tend to encounter most um, in historic collections and buildings is, of course, the filamentous fungi. Hopefully we don't have any mushrooms growing, but you, you might encounter them in a really damp basement on some wood, but ho hopefully not. Um, so mold is the common word for the group of filamentous fungi that grow in indoor and outdoor environments. Not picky. Um, mold and other fungi acquire food by absorption and they secrete enzymes that break down the cellulose materials around them, which is why as a paper conservator, I'm especially um, worried about them and aware of the type of damage they do. Um, so basically the way that mold works, it will digest or eat the material on which it grows. Um, one question that we get fairly often is, you know, what is mildew? And, and mildew is not any less bad than in mold. It's just mold in an early stage of growth. There's something else to be aware of. Um, and I think we all sort of know what mold and mildew smells like. So, you know, you can rely on your sense of smell as well as visual clues um, that you might need to look, look around closely and make sure you're not having a problem. So molds multiply by producing microscopic spores that easily float through the air. Molds are part of the natural environment and they can be found everywhere. So they're everywhere around us right now, whether we're indoors or outdoors. Um, however, this is the sort of the key point that I'm sure some of you are aware of, but the way to prevent a mold growth and outbreak is to control the moisture. Mold cannot grow if there's not moisture present. So Rachel and I thought it would also be useful to just sort of touch base on what is not mold um, because I, I get a lot of clients who call me and say, oh, I have something moldy, I want to bring it in, and then I have to give them a whole procedure on how to bring moldy objects into my studio so that I don't get potential con contamination. Um, and some of the times what the client thinks is mold is actually something else. Um, I would say the most common um, material that shows up on a lot of paper items that people sometimes mistake as mold is foxing. Um, foxing is one of those things in the world of conservation that we're still not 100% sure what it is. Um, it's kind of been categorized into two types of, of staining. Um, the simplest one to understand is that when, when paper was made, um, there's metal used in that process. So sometimes in the paper making process, little tiny flecks of metal from the machinery or the screens um, do break off and deposit into the paper fibers. So what happens when metal is exposed to moisture? It rusts. So sometimes the foxing is what we call metal-induced foxing, and you can often find a little tiny speck of metal in the center of the circular stain. The other time, the type of foxing that I think is really probably more common based on my experience is the one, it's, it's, it's related to moisture. Um, it's not active mold though. And these are sort of the soft, fuzzy, rusty orange brown circular stains. Um, and I sort of like what AIC has to say, that's the American Institute of Conservation. Um, and their definition is, it may be easier to define what foxing stains are not. They are not the mold stains with or without surface growth, which severely deteriorate the paper and cause a variety of colorations. They are not offset stains from contact with another paper or printing ink or acid stains. 
So it's something to be aware of. You can certainly have mold and foxing together, but if you just see foxing, that doesn't mean you're having a, a mold outbreak. Um, acid and water stains, I think these are usually fairly uh, more straightforward to identify as not being mold, um, but the family record on the left, those round stains are from wood acid stains from the knots in the piece of wood that was behind that piece of paper in its original frame. Doesn't really look like mold, but just throwing it out there. Um, water stains, the, the two portraits on the right, um, there are some pretty dark water stains. I think, again, these are fairly easy to identify as not being mold, but I would say if you have pieces in your collection that do have water stains, it is a good idea to look and see if you see evidence of mold growth, because if you see a water stain, you obviously know that that paper was wet for some time. Heavy soiling. Um, this can sometimes be harder to rule out, um, but oftentimes if you know the history of the piece that can help you, um, you know, identify that what you're looking at is some really serious dirt and grime. Um, the object on the left is actually a metal sign. We don't often treat non-paper based things, but this is one that we did treat here. And it was in a service station for most of its life and was just incredibly dirty. Um, the book on the right is a original edition of Peter, Peter Rabbit. Um, and it had a lot of grimy, grimy fingerprints um, and dirt just from many years of being handled. So Carolyn explained that what mold is, this filamentous fungi, the fact that it's latent in the environment all the time, it's, it's always present. So what makes it grow? What makes it what we would call, a, we often call a mold bloom? What makes it, makes it start to send up those, those little filaments? Um, and it must have a couple ingredients. It must have something to eat and it must have moisture. And moisture is really the most critical factor in determining whether that latent spore is going to start to, to reproduce. Um, and it can grow on virtually any type of organic substance. And we're most familiar probably with the, the leftover, well, the leftover food in the back of the refrigerator that you discover two months later that may have all manner of fascinating molds on it. Um, but it does like things um, that you would have in your collections as well, including paper and textiles, which have a lot of inherent moisture within them. Um, this, this, this inclination toward bloom, toward growth, can be exacerbated if you have no ventilation, if your air is very stagnant, um, and if there's, if there's not much light either. Uh, the different types of light waves can help keep those molds mold spores dormant um, and in the absence of them they will start to they'll start to grow. The higher temperatures can also be um, a major factor especially in combination with humidity. Uh, so these are the things that you have to bear in mind that that you need to try to mitigate against in order to try to to keep that that bloom from happening. Um, and you can probably think about your storage space and, 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 and identify immediately some issues you might have. Uh, if it's a basement space, you're probably gonna have moisture concerns. Uh, light may be dim. You may not have much airflow, you know, but there are things you can do, tools you can use, appliances you can plug in that can help to, to make it um, less of a friendly environment for molds to grow. Um, and one thing that's often stressed is the environmental factors can, it doesn't take very much time for them to trigger a mold bloom. So some say 48 hours or 72 hours at the right temperature and humidity levels, you could start to have uh, quite a, a, a widespread impact. And sometimes things will happen throughout a collection area Sometimes it'll be just at the point where there was say a leak um, or other literally water introduced to the, to the space. Um, it could be that, the, um, that it's only certain types of materials that seem more prone to mold. One thing that, that I've noticed uh, in my own experience, and Carolyn, I don't know if, if, if you can, can 
can speak to this as a conservator, but black buckram for some reason would seem to be one of the, the, the surface areas that would, I would first see mold appearing on. Um, and that, so that, it, once I knew that, that would be what I would check in a certain collection storage area where I knew I had mold issues is I would go check the black buckram bindings. And if I saw some growth on them, I would know that I needed to, 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 to up my game. I needed to start doing more to try to mitigate um, against that growth. Yeah, um, I, mean, I would say that's definitely true. Um, the, the one thing I've also really noticed um, as a paper conservator that mold really loves pastel. Um, I think that there is something in the binding medium that it just it doesn't take a lot of moisture to activate the mold growth. Um, and as you can imagine, trying to remove powdery mold from powdery pastel is very challenging. And sometimes we can do it and sometimes we cannot. But that also seems to be a, a real indicator. Um, mm -hmm. What was that word you just used? Interfeeder? Uh, indicate, indicator. 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 Right. Got it. Um, yeah. And another thing that I, so I, I will be honest and say that I, I did have a slight mold outbreak last year at home um, in my closet. So exactly those conditions Rachel just mentioned. It's dark. There was no air circulation because I kept the doors closed so I didn't have to see my stuff. Um, and it happened in the fall when there was a really series, a series of really big temperature swings. Um, and the other thing that I noticed, which, you know, we know, we, we, we know this is true, but it was really incredible to see, um, is what a big role dirt and soiling plays. Like I could see like on my bags or like my leather bags or my clothes, like actually like fingerprint areas. Um, or if I had hung something up that I hadn't washed yet um, or that needed dry cleaning. It was incredible. So that I think you know that's something that I think is important to bear in mind. That one of one of the really big reasons for having good housekeeping practices in your in your museums and collections um, is to help prevent providing a food source for for mold. Yeah, and you you reminded me, Carolyn. I was telling you yesterday about that death to PowerPoint T-shirt that I made for myself for my graduation from library school back in the 90s when PowerPoint was not the beautiful thing you're seeing today. Um, and yeah, I, I, I pulled it out recently and it's got a lot of mold. And where's the mold? It's in the armpits where I sweat because I put it away without having washed it because if I'd washed it, the, the, the felt letters would have run and would have ruined the shirt. So, so yeah, that, that, that soiling and, and how clean is something when it gets stored away um, is another really important thing to think about and and the importance of good housekeeping whether it's 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 getting your textiles to a certain level of cleanliness um, prior to storage or a some sort of routine for going through your stacks and doing stack maintenance wiping down shelves wiping down bindings wiping down boxes um, that's all going to help again make it a less inviting environment for the molds Right. So, I do and just say it's, it's another good reason. Um, now we're all very hyper aware of washing our hands, but it's another really compelling reason to make sure, you know, if you're handling collections, um, I won't go into gloves versus not gloves right now, but if you are handling things with your bare hands or you have researchers or staff, um, again, it, it was really incredible to see what a difference dirty touch services played in encouraging mold growth. So. Another, another reason to make sure your hands are clean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know people are often the, the, the worst enemy of collections, but another important thing to consider is kind of your biggest collections envelope is your building. Um, and in addition to making sure the, the room in which your collection material is, is, has a certain level of cleanliness, making sure that your building envelope is, is, is not compromised, um, that it's stable, that there aren't leaks, that everything is sealed, um, but that there is good airflow, that's all important as well. Um, one thing that I've seen a lot too is it's, it's not just necessarily things that leak, but condensation on pipes. Um, and I've seen that in, in, in many different institutions where I've worked and where I've roved to and, and done site visits, where 
either it's insulated and the insulation has got, it's an insulated pipe and the insulation is now covered in mold, or it's not an insulated pipe and the water that's condensating around the pipe is dripping um, and, and, and putting, that, putting that air, that, putting that water into that, that air, into that environment. So a lot of, of, of careful observation and knowing your space uh, can also be helpful. And keeping a log of known issues um, that, that ideally is passed down through the ages so you can see what might have been a problem in that space 20 years ago. Um, and then someone in the future can see that in 2020, what kind of an event you might have had to encounter in there. So keeping, keeping good records can also be useful. Um, and then once you've identified a problem, of course, if you have the means, doing what you can to try to mitigate it. unmute myself. So I sort of again to, to touch base on what, what Rachel is saying, um, really knowing where to look proactively for potential sources of moisture in your building. Um, moisture is in the air. Um, I think one of the things we'll, we'll talk about later um, is, is the importance of trying to monitor your environment, um, especially the relative humidity. And I, I personally really feel like even if it's an inexpensive one, it's still better than nothing. It might not be the most accurate, but it will give you an idea at least of when your humidity levels are going up and down. Um, and that's really a key indicator that you're having a, a problem. Um, so moisture can also be in the objects or your collections itself um, or themselves, especially things that absorb moisture, which is many types of materials in historic collections, but especially things like textiles and paper. Um, moisture is going to be in the mold itself. It has to be there for it to grow. And then moisture can be in the building or your storage materials. Um, I think that's something we, we sometimes forget about is that, yes, we're putting all of these wonderful collections in archival folders and boxes. Um, but those, those paper-based materials are also, that the, the storage housings are made of, are also absorbent of moisture. Um, we don't really recommend storing things in plastic bins most of the time, um, partly because the opposite can happen there. You can create a micro environment. A little bit of moisture can get in there and then be trapped. Um, and I've, I've definitely seen that happen. Um, so that's just something else to be, be aware of. But again, we're gonna say this over and over again, the key player that you're trying to keep out um, is, is moisture. And here it is, condensation. Um, again, to go back, back to what happened to, to me personally last year, um, my family owns a very small cabin right next to our home in Chester and nobody had been staying there for a month. And I went down there the same weekend that I noticed mold growing in my closet at home and every window and door, every glass surface was covered in, in condensation like that. And sure enough, I opened up the front door and there was mold everywhere, all over the furniture, all over the floor, the carpet, the couch. And that, I wish, I don't think I took photos of that, but that was just, I will say it was not a couch that we bought, it came with this cabin, but you could see all of like the food and dirty handprints were just like covered in moldy bloom. Really gross. So condensation, if you see condensation anywhere in your building, um, you know you have a problem that needs to be addressed right away and start looking for mold um, throughout the building and in your collections. Um, this, this photo in the center there shows um, water damage in a basement, and you can see there are some dark blotchy mold growths on the wall, um, sort of circular greenish brown blotches. Um, just to point out, thank you, Rachel. Oh, sorry. Yep. Right. Um, the white, sometimes with, when you have a water event, um, you will see white deposits. If they're sort of hard and crusty, you're probably not seeing mold, you're seeing mineral deposits. Um, and we, we see that sometimes on um, paper-based materials that have been in frames and some of the 
components from the, the frame itself has gotten wet and that will migrate in. And um, we'll see it with you know, things that have been hung on a wall with plaster. Um, you'll start seeing those white mineral deposits. But that's, that's not to say mold growth itself can't be white. It can be lots of different colors. Um, but if you see those hard, pressy deposits, it's minerals, but you're also, that's a good indicator that you've had a moisture problem. Um, that last photo just shows very obvious water staining um, where there's been a leak in the exterior wall. Um, you know, we as paper conservators always really encourage people not to hang um, historic materials on an exterior wall because especially here in New England, again, it's this big temperature swings and condensation events um, that can cause all kinds of problems. Yeah, and I don't know if any of you have had experience looking behind a framed item or a piece of furniture against an exterior wall and finding either mold or a condensation behind it, because that's something I've experienced. And um, I think so. that's often a place where you see mildew. I think yeah. as, as more and more things are framed, um, with the dark dust covers behind them, you can really see, see those outbreaks happening pretty quickly. Um, and that's something to check for, you know, to, you know, if you're really being on top of your monitoring game and you know you have things hanging on an exterior wall, you know, periodically throughout the summer, take a couple of things off and look and see, see what's going on back there. Yeah. Yeah, so why, why is this a problem? Why do, we, why, do we not, why do we worry so much about mold? What's the concern? Um, and first and foremost, I know we've been talking mostly making allusions to collections materials, but we really want to stress that the, 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 the most critical issue about mold is the potential impact it has on your, on your health, on human health. Um, it, can be, it can be toxic. In, in my experience, the types of molds that tend to grow on collections have not been toxic, um, but that's not to say that sometimes they could be or that the molds that might be inhabiting your building um, could be, you know, we've heard of black mold, molds that, that could have a, a really serious impact. But even if it's not, you know, a serious effect, uh, it could, it does pose quite a risk. Uh, they also do, obviously, as we've, if, as we've been mentioning, as we'll go into more detail soon, it, it, they can be really damaging to the materials, um, and both structurally and aesthetically. Um, and especially, you know, textiles and paper are some of our most hygroscopic materials in our, in our holdings. Um, They're going to be able to absorb much more moisture than, um, than many other types of artifacts or objects that, that, are, that are harder. Um, that are also organic materials, but are not, are not going to be um, allowing quite as much moisture to flow in and out of them. Um, so one thing, and it's, it's fun, it, with doing this within kind of the, the, the time of COVID-19, it's, it's in some ways there's some parallels in that people respond really differently to mold. Some folks will have absolutely no no reaction whatsoever. Other people can get swollen up and some of the swelling can happen in their throat and they'll soon have trouble breathing. Um, if you have any pre-existing conditions like asthma or other types of allergies um, that have got your histamines up and activated, that can, it can be a further trigger. Um, so it's hard to know um, how it's going to interact with people. And this was something when I was director of archives at HSP, we discussed because we had a, we had a, a room where we did, we cleaned collections for mold. And then once they were cleaned, we were offering them up to researchers in the reading room. And we decided that we needed to include a statement on the finding aid and in the box of the collection with that material itself to make sure that people knew both at the time when they were thinking about looking at it and then at the point when they're actually at the box, um, that that material had been known to have had a history of mold. Because again, as Carolyn said, those, those spores are still there. We're just, we've deactivated them. Um, but for someone who's extremely sensitive, that might even be enough to trigger some sort of reaction. So thinking about how you share information with your, with your researchers, with your users, 
whether it's materials on exhibit um, or things that you're, you're presenting in a reading room, that's something to keep in mind, uh, that, that there's kind of a right to know, and how do you present that, uh, present that to people? Can I, can I jump in for a second? Please. Uh, and say, so yeah, I also, whenever we treat moldy materials here, we, we add that to the treatment report and print something out to go in the storage box and folders um, if, it's a, if it's a collection that's gonna be used. Um, but the other thing I've, I've noticed um, and that I would also caution is that, you know, there, there are some historic buildings here, small house museums, otherwise, um, where I've worked that they have had known mold problems um, throughout their collections and within the building. And I've also encouraged those, those clients to, to have a notice out for visitors to know that ahead of time before they set foot in the building. Um, because as Rachel was saying, you know, some people are not bothered by it at all, and some people are incredibly um, reactive to it. Um, and I, I will say that when I, when I started in conservation, I was not um, at all reactive, and I, I worked on a really large collection of moldy 18th century Italian manuscripts um, in a fume hood, and later we learned the fume hood was not running as well as we thought, and I, I did, after that point, become more sensitive to mold, whereas before I was one of those people that never, never noticed. Um, so it is, it is, it is a real thing that can happen. That you can become um, more reactive to it over time. The more you're exposed to it. Yeah, and that's absolutely something that I've been that I've been told ever since I was in library school. And I think I, I, I can. I think there are certain types of molds where I will now get a certain response. And we probably all had the experience of walking into a space and just, you know, your nose starts tickling, your eyes start to burn, maybe your throat starts to close up and get scratchy. You know, that you, you get, your body is sending signals that this is not a good environment. I'm, I, I'm not able to breathe properly in here. Um, so, you know, obviously listen to that and, and remove yourself from that situation. But it is, it's, it's an occupational hazard and uh, something to be aware of um, if you do work closely with collections materials that there is this sense that over time you are going to probably develop um, more of a sensitivity if you didn't have one at the beginning. So again, preemptive things like wearing a mask, wearing gloves, washing your hands, not touching your face when you're working with, with materials that you think might have, have had mold or, or have, have a mold issue happening um, right then. Uh, all things to think about doing. Um, as I said, yeah, PPEs, we now are much more savvy about, about these than we were a few months ago. Um, and it could be, you, know, you could take it to the point of wearing some sort of Tyvek suit um, or, or goggles to protect your eyes from, from the spores. And the N95s, uh, once they're more widely available again, are, are, will give you the, an appropriate level of protection. Um, and some sort of disposable glove, nitrile or preferred. Uh, some people have allergies to latex. Um, so yeah, you wanna, you wanna be aware of, of, of the space you're entering into. And I don't, you know, I'm not saying necessarily that you need to kind of suit yourself up every time you go into your storage space, but certainly if you know there's an issue and you're going to investigate further, absolutely take precautions. And for people who are sensitive, consider maybe throwing a mask on before going into the space, even if you're just going in to retrieve some material. So I'm gonna jump in and talk a little bit about when not to go in and start dealing with things yourselves. Um, if you get into your building and you notice something that even remotely looks like that, or you see mold growth across collection or on the walls, that, that's when you wanna back yourself out of that space. Um, don't go back in there without wearing the necessary PPEs. And you wanna get on the phone and call um, a conservator and you wanna talk to a mold remediation company, um, depending on the size and type of event, you might also end up working with a disaster recovery company like Belfour. Um, I have I've worked on a handful of projects, mostly, mostly involving historic wallpaper, um, where the buildings had been closed up um, and the owners went in 
after months of not being in there and I, I worked on a project in Rhode Island um, with a hand painted late um, 18th century wallpaper and the, the, the historic home had been closed. The caretaker I think had forgotten to go in and the family went to the house to open it up for I think Thanksgiving and there was mold on every surface in the house. Um, so I was contracted by the mold remediation company and we did wear Tyvek suits and I took a change of clothes. Um, I did not eat in that space. Um, I was pretty horrified to see that some of the other workers when they were taking their breaks, it was like, oh yeah, we don't have to wear PPEs anymore. I'm just gonna eat my sandwich and have my mask off. Um, I took myself out of the building. I think, um, you know, I th after after um, major events like hurricanes where things are wet for a long time and it's summertime and it's damp, um, that's when you tend to see more serious mold outbreaks like this. Um, but, you know, just depending on the condition and contents and materials of your building, it, it can certainly happen. Um, and I think, again, you know, we, we just really want to urge that everyone err on the side of, of caution. Um, you know, conservators of all types, um, we, are, we are here to help you um, figure out what, what to do um, if you encounter even a small amount of mold in your collection or a big outbreak in, in your building. Um, and, and again, that's, that's one of the roles that this organization will play, CCCA, um, and the National Heritage Responders. Um, again, we're, we're that part of my life that's more aimed at larger scale events. Um, but that's another resource if you ever have any sort of major or even moderate mold outbreak, you really want to start by, by calling um, some professionals and, and finding out what the next best steps are to, to stabilize the building. Carolyn, they're mowing the lawn right outside my window, so I might ask you to keep going if you don't mind. I will just jump in and say that one thing that we have here in Vermont is a statewide contract with Polygon, which is a disaster recovery vendor. So if you do have collections materials that are impacted by mold, you can call them and um, contract with them at the rates that have been negotiated with the state. And I'd be happy to share more information about that with anyone. Yeah. And I will also jump in here and say, um, so more commercial based companies like ServPro, um, can't think of that, there's a couple other ones in this region, they are not necessarily the people you want to handle your historic collections. Um, you know, we've, we've tried to do as much outreach as we can to say, you know, if you're handling an art collection in a private home or any sort of cultural material you know, these are the, the conservators you want to contact first um, because you don't want to have your historic cultural important materials treated the same way you might treat your administrative office materials. Um, so that's something else to be aware of. I've, I've been doing more and more work um, through ServPro that's based out of Keene now that they know I'm here. Um, it, it's all about outreach and, and, and educating, educating them. Um, so I just wanted to jump in and, and say that as well. There are different methods that you want to use for different types of, of materials, for sure. Um, so Rachel, you want me to sort of jump in and go over this? Okay, so I will talk about really briefly um, the types of paper materials that are commonly damaged by mold. Um, I guess my, my universal comment is it's, it's not that picky. As, as Rachel and I were saying, um, it does seem to like some materials more than, than others, so like the black spectrum cloth and pastel, um, but it can certainly grow on any type of paper, paper surface. Those are just some examples. Or, or leather, um, it loves powdery mildew, loves to grow on leather. Um, so that's another good thing. If you know you have leather in your collection, that's a good place to look um, to catch an early outbreak of a mold problem. Um, to get back specifically to how does mold damage paper. So it does a couple of different things. Now, as the mold is growing and thriving and eating, it's, it's digesting the cellulose fibers, it's digesting the sizing in the paper, it might be digesting the adhesive or certain types of media. Um, and as that happens, moldy areas are often 
accompanied by very weakened paper fibers. Sometimes the mold has attacked the paper so thoroughly that what's left basically feels like wet toilet paper. It has no structural integrity. Um, whereas an unaffected area of the same piece of wove paper is very strong. So you can really see this firsthand, um, just how structurally damaging mold can be. Um, it can cause damage to the media. Again, with the way that it attacks pastel, it will make these little hard deposits um, and kind of eats away the binding media. And then you end up with these little tiny divots um, a lot of the times as it's taken that material away. Um, one of the, the questions I get a lot as a paper conservator, you know, if I'm doing a treatment where there's any kind of staining, you know, we always say stains will be reduced but may not be eliminated entirely. Certain types of staining, um, like water stains and foxing, tend to respond better to the types of treatments we can perform. Mold staining, if I, if I know there's mold staining on an object, I pretty much tell the client it's very unlikely that it's going to reduce. Um, every now and then you get lucky and you can sort of reduce it a little bit, but most of the time um, those coloration changes are, are permanent um, in terms of what we can safely do um, to try to remove them. And they can be incredibly colorful. They can be pink, they can be yellow, they can be green. Um, I think the most common one we see tends to be that grayish black or purplish black, um, but you can get some real interesting color variants. So how can a conservator help you? Um, so conservators are trained to deal with mold on historical collections and cultural objects. Um, I was going to say we do have Michelle Pagan, who's a very experienced textile conservator and CCCA board member here with us. So Michelle, if you ever want to chime in and sort of make some specific, specific comments about textiles, please, please do. We're happy to have you here with us um, for this workshop. Um, but again, you know, if you, if you get into your collection or some, let's say someone wants to donate something to you that has mold growth on it, um, in that instance, I would encourage you before you take that item into your building or collection that you contact a conservator first um, and sort of talk to them about what to do to ensure that that object, if you really do want it to come into your collection, doesn't then spread mold to other things within your building and collection. Um, so we're always happy to provide advice over the phone or email, and now we're also used to doing video chats. Um, I've, I've been doing that with some clients on some times when normally I would have gone and done a site visit, but instead we're, we're doing it all through our smartphones. Um, again, like I said, we might make a site visit to assess, you know, why, why are you having this problem? Because one thing I tell clients all the time is there's not really any point in you sending your collection here to me to have treatment for mold remediation if it's going right back into that same building environment. The mold is just going to come back. Um, and that's one thing that we've noticed over the years is that collections materials that have had mold breaks are much more susceptible to have them again um, than materials that have not. So that's something to bear in mind, um, that if you, if you have mold in your collections, you really have to address the environment, environmental conditions in the building first um, before you start worrying about the individual objects within that collection. Um, we can provide guidelines for preventing mold outbreaks, and that's part of what we're going to do in this, this workshop, um, but conservators can make specific recommendations based on your building's details. Um, we can provide training for staff and core volunteers, which is something I've done a couple times um, recently here in Vermont, working with local historical societies, um, to do safe mold remediation when they can. Um, we can also perform conservation treatments to address mold damage to collections. So how do we remove mold from the paper? Well, sometimes we feel like we can remove most of it. Sometimes we feel like we can't really remove any of it with certain types of pastel. Um, so we look at what the object is itself in terms of what the materials are and assess how much or how little mold remediation treatment we can do. Um, usually the first step when we can um, is to make sure that everything is completely dried out. Um, we don't want to be working on damp materials for several reasons. One, the mold is still actively growing there and also you can't 
effectively removed damp, spongy mold spores. They have to be totally dry um, to have any chance of really removing them as much as you can from the surface of the object. Mm -hmm. So once we know that everything is dry, um, then we would ideally start by vacuuming all the surfaces of the object using a soft brush um, and a HEPA filtered vacuum so that we're not just sending mold spores through the air in our space. Um, and we also use a, you know, there's a regulated suction. You can't use too much suction, obviously. So it's something that usually is best left to a, a trained conservator, but certainly, you know, that's one of the things I've taught in workshops is how, you know, if you have a large collection of moldy books, um, that might be a case where a conservator can come in and train your staff on how to deal with that safely themselves in terms of safety for them and also safety for the collection. Um, to really feel as good as we can about reducing fungal growth, um, the best treatment when you can do it safely and not damage the object is to do a uh, treatment in that involves alcohol. And that essentially dries out um, the structure of the mold, the mold cells so that it can't be active anymore until it gets reactivated by moisture again. But that's something that we can only do that when the media is gonna allow us to do it. Uh, so I'm just going to show a couple of examples. Um, this was a Sheen Cole engraving from 1854. And you can see, maybe Rachel, you can use your, your mouse, the sort of white fuzzy growths there. Um, this one, Sheen Cole, I won't get into the details, but getting these wet is generally not advisable. So this was just a dry treatment where I went in with a tiny brush and a small nozzle on the vacuum cleaner after I'd vacuumed everything overall and sort of tickled all the little mold growths off the surface of the paper and printing ink. Um, and this is again a time where it has to go back into a dry environment um, to prevent this from happening again. Um, this is one where we were able to do much more in-depth treatment um, the dry vacuuming, surface cleaning, and then a series of wet treatments, including the alcohol bath. And then this one had a series of stain reducing treatments. And in this case, the, the gray blackish mold stains did reduce much better, better than I had expected, but they are still, they are still there. And then this is a good example, I'm sort of showing you how these, these dark brown black mold stains did not, they didn't reduce at all. Um, and that, that this is sort of more typical of, of what we would expect to see in terms of stain treatment on, on most paper-based collections um, once you have those really dark mold stains. Thanks uh, for jumping in there, Carolyn. Dave has now taken the lawnmower around the corner, so I <laughs> feel better about speaking again. Um, so what you can do to prevent mold outbreaks, um, uh, this you probably should already know by what we've talked about in the last almost hour, you want to control the moisture um, any which way you can. Um, and if you can't, try to find some other place to store materials. Um, the best thing to do um, is to not just rely on on what you feel in the environment. I mean, we certainly can, that's a, a, that's a good indicator if you could get some sort of data logger that, or, or, or hydrothermograph or temperature and humidity monitor, you can get, a, you know, as Carolyn said, better to get a cheap one that does a decent job of being accurate than to not have one at all. Uh, so $25 at the hardware store should get you something that will monitor the temperature and humidity. What it won't do is necessarily store that information over time. So you can go in spot check and see what it was and if it does have the capability of, of, of recording what the maximum and the minimum numbers were, you can see what the range was, but you won't necessarily be able to, 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 to graph what that, what that fluctuation has been over time. Data loggers will do that. And there's, there's many different, different types and many of them are designed to work with complementary software that when you upload your data, it will do some analysis for you. The one I'm most familiar with is uh, the Image Permanence Institute's eClimate Notebook, which is available for free um, if you're only looking at, a, at two or three data sets at a time. 
Um, and it will do a lot of crunching for you about not only uh, of the numbers of your data um, from the logger, but also kind of assessing what the risks are for your collections for different types of materials. Uh, so that can be really helpful, both for the information it gives you as someone who's, who's responsible for materials. It also can provide very exciting looking graphics. The one for, I did one environmental assessment for, um, for Hampshire College down in Massachusetts and they had one storage space where the mold risk was this, this really terrifying looking red, uh, red line going up off the graph. So that's something that, that then the collections person can take to, um, take to administration or take and maybe in your case to the board and say, look, we've got a real problem here that we need to address. And it's not just me telling you that I go to work and I'm getting all sweaty. It's, it's, it's data and it's about not you and how you're feeling, but it's about, about the environment um, your collections are being exposed to and what the experts say is gonna happen if that exposure continues. Can I, can I jump in and add? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I'm still using um, the, another relatively inexpensive data logger is the Hobo Onset. Mm -hmm. And that's what I use here, and they cost around $120. So you don't have to make a huge financial investment, and that does track the data. I can download it all. Um, some of them now do it all wirelessly. There's a lot of good options. But just to piggyback on what Rachel was saying, um, when you have that data, you, it can also really make you a much more successful grant applicant uh, as a grant reviewer for IMLS and NEH. Um, we really are much more likely to approve an application if we can see that the institution is at least tracking what is going on environmentally. And if they know they have a problem, they have some plans in place on how to address it. Um, because again, that we don't, there's not a whole lot of point of sending things out for conservation treatment if it's going back into a potentially damaging environment. So it's good for grant applications. Yeah, and I'll, I'll also say that I, um, I, I'm stealing an idea from Massachusetts where they had a, they've had a long time in a free environmental monitoring program through the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. Um, so in the latest grant I wrote to NHPRC, uh, one, of the, one of the funders of the VHRP, the Vermont Historical Records Program, I asked for money for data loggers with the intent of then starting a program in Vermont where you could at St. Albans, Alex and, and Lisa, ask for, um, ask for some monitors to be put into your storage spaces. We leave them there for several months. Ideally, you do a year so you can see what a whole calendar year since our seasons are so different here, um, but at least for a few months and then do some analysis and provide you with a report. Uh, so that's a program I'm hoping that there'll be funding for the equipment that we can then use for, for many years to come in the future here. Um, desired relative humidity, 35 to 60%. Uh, rule of thumb is if it's over 60 for any length of time, you have increased the chances of uh, having a mold bloom. And that's going to, again, depend on some of those other factors like, like airflow, like temperature, like light level. Um, and temps, 50 to 75 Again, this is where the desire to mitigate against the, the possibility of mold can come into tension with sustainability, energy costs, all sorts of other really valid concerns for your, for your repository. So I'll just say that colder is always, always better for materials as long as it doesn't get so cold that it, that it makes the humidity level rise. Um, so colder will slow down all sorts of deterioration um, as well as the possibility of, of mold growth as long as that relative humidity can stay below the desired range or within the desired range, not go above it. Um, and you want, as Carolyn's been saying, spot check. Uh, try to, to learn what your canaries are in your coal mine um, so you know what to look for. Use your senses. Um, look at your data if you are doing some monitoring. And another important area to think about is what do you do when new things come into the collection? Of course, this is important not just for, for mold. This is important for all sorts of pests, um, other types of issues that you may unwittingly be bringing in. 
with new materials. So some sort of quarantine space, uh, so you can, so you can have a chance to, to thoroughly screen and make sure that there's no mold coming in um, can be good as well. And, and rethink, if you can, where you're storing materials, if they are in chronically damp spaces right now. Um, and if you don't have the ability to move them, absolutely start monitoring that, that environment um, so you have some, some numbers to, to use to try to get some leverage for building a case for why things do need to be moved. And know what, you know, know what you're dealing with. And as you know, Carolyn's house is, is stone and that, those are gonna kind of bring in the moisture and then just kind of hold it and then they'll sweat a little bit. I mean, that's, that's gonna, it's gonna be kind of a cold and clammy environment, which you know, the cold can be great, but the clamminess can, can also be, be, be less desirable. Um, and see what your options are. Does it, is it feasible for you to run a dehumidifier? Or is, that, uh, is the fire risk too great uh, of having an appliance running? Can you run it while you're there? Um, who's going to be emptying the water? I mean, that's, that can be common. <laughs> I've been at some places where that's, that's the obstacle, is that there's either someone, no one who's strong enough to empty that water bucket. Um, if it's not one that's got uh, the ability to go directly out of drain, um, or it becomes a, a chore that, that no one wants to do. So what, what are you able to do as a, as a person or as a group of people who are caring for materials? Um, and yeah, if there's, some, if there's some ceiling that can be done around your windows to keep the condensation out, that would be, that would be good to do. You know, any, any, any of these signs of moisture incursions into your space are indicators that there's some sort of vulnerability that you could try to address. And sometimes it's, you know, a little bit of caulk can go a really long way. So that's it for us. Um, thank you for your, your, your time and attention. We're gonna turn it over to Erica. Um, don't hesitate to be in touch with us. Hopefully you, you, you have our info. Um, the slides will be available, the recording's available, um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be around. I'm going to stop the share now and hope that Erica can pick it up. And I'm going to take a peek at the chat. Eileen, I am ready for you to make me the host. Thank you. I think Michelle was trying to talk. Michelle, you were on mute. We didn't hear you. On mute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, Michelle. Can you hear me now? Yes, go I'm, ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted. Okay, all right, I can see you, Erica. Okay, I just wanted to um, throw this in, if it'll be helpful. Um, as um, somebody, pre I think Rachel mentioned, I'm in the middle, or I'm a textile conservator here in East Dorset, and I'm in the middle of a, a mold bloom right now because the weather just changed. And we went from this really dry period, you know, which I think most of us experience statewide, right? Um, suddenly the weather has changed, and, and here in East Dorset anyway, we're getting rain almost every day. And so I've had a mold bloom on uh, an antique dress form that I have in-house right now. The, the, the job was to work on the um, dress, to get the dress ready to go on exhibit, but they also had an antique dress form. And so I grabbed that too as I was leaving the site with the dress. I also snagged the um, dress form. Well, guess what? The dress form is made of paper mache. And so, as was just mentioned, you know, the materials themselves absorb and hold moisture. And so this antique dress form um, has taken on enough moisture here with the change in humidity that we've just experienced that I've got a, a mold bloom going on right now. And um, I'll be taking care of it exactly as was just outlined in the series of slides here. So, you know, <laughs> not to panic. But uh, I, I, and I'm monitoring the temp on RH in my workroom every day. And sure enough, it just went above 60% RH. And that's why I've got this gloom going on. So everything you heard so far today is exactly true. 
<laughs> you could take it to the bank. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. So um, I am rounding out our presentation with a bit of a case study uh, from my work as the Special Collections Director at Champlain College. Knock on wood, I have not had a major mold outbreak, but I have definitely have the environment that is at risk for it. And I definitely have collections um, that have come in that I um, am concerned about. So I'm gonna share with you some steps that I've taken some of which are extremely low budget that I think um, anyone would be able to replicate. Um, and then also some um, thoughts about uh, what, what maybe um, we can do in the future to move the needle from maybe good to better to best. So I manage a special collections program at Champlain College, which includes the college archives tons of paper-based materials there, tons of documents, bound material, printed material, uh, tons of photographs in all sorts of different formats, um, lots of textiles as well, and also some local history collections, um, same kinds of media. So I've got a very, a collection that's very heavily skewed towards paper and textiles, um, definitely um, some major at-risk materials. And um, I'm lucky enough to work in this uh, gorgeous library building, which was built in 1998, um, which is on the Champlain College campus. However, when the building was constructed, um, there was no conscious plan for special collections. Special collections was not um, designed in as far as a reading room space or storage areas. So I've kind of retrofitted a bunch of spaces um, for my use. I have a reading room and then right now a bunch of storage closets. So I've got collections on four floors of the building and unfortunately for me and I suspect for many of you a lot of my stuff is below grade. So I'm in the basement, which is one floor below the main entrance. Um, so the first thing that I did when I recognized the situation when I first started working for Champlain was to um, invest in, actually not maybe invest because I picked the pretty cheap monitors, just the regular temperature and humidity monitors that Rachel and Carolyn were talking about you can buy at the hardware store um, first and then eventually upgraded to a data logger. Um, so I have several of these in different storage areas so that I can monitor the temperature and humidity. Um, and when I first arrived, very little funding. I, with that um, temperature and humidity monitor that I got at the hardware store, which had no way just to um, automatically record information, what I did was I went around with the clipboard on a regular schedule and just recorded the data that I was seeing so that I could graph out myself over time what was happening. And then a couple years after that, I got the funding for the type that you see on the right, which are the PEM2 monitors. Um, and those, um, those uh, have a USB port, so you can take your memory stick to them and um, download the data on a regular basis. And then I'm definitely have been using the eClimate notebook software that several people have talked about. And I want to show you the um, the data recording that I um, the graph that eClimate notebook spit out for me. This is one year of data for my primary storage space. So first of all, uh, you can see that I've got this massive roller coaster for relative high humidity. Um, so this is pre-humidity controls of any type. Um, you can see quite a bit of readings from above 60%, um, including, as you will notice, um, some of those readings happening at times of the year when maybe we wouldn't necessarily think um, to be looking for relative high humidity. And I will point out that um, this is a heated space that I'm working with, working in, 
that my collections are stored in. So I do see that drop in relative humidity in the winter when the heat is on. But some of you may be working or having collections in spaces that aren't heated. And I would um, warn you to just make sure that you're monitoring that RH in the fall, the winter, and the spring because you can see those spikes in relative humidity, uh, particularly in a space that's not heated in the winter as well as, as well as the summer. Michelle, I see your hand raised. Yeah, Eric, Erica, do you know why? Why do you have those peaks and valleys? It almost looks like daily, especially during those winter months. Does that have something to do with your heating system, perhaps? Excellent question. This um, is because this building is primarily managed as a library, of course. Lots of traffic, people coming out, in and out, but um, particularly because we're in an academic library setting, we have open hours and closed hours, and our building manager, um, you know, logically thinking about sustainability and about energy costs, has the primary building control set to sunset at different points in the day or over the weekends or for um, major holiday periods. So um, this was great, a great argument for me. I took this data to um, the library administration and also to our physical plan and said, um, this is great for conser energy conservation, but this is not gonna work for collections. Um, so I've had partial success in that I was lucky enough that um, although I am in a retrofitted area, the main room I use for collection storage is on a different zone. So they were able to change the settings for that zone so that um, I have constant settings throughout the year rather mm -hmm. than those off and on periods. Okay. Can I jump in and add one thing too real quickly? Of course. Um, so one thing that, that I personally encountered as COVID started shutting down places like universities and libraries um, was that boards and decision makers were doing just that. They thought, oh, this is a great chance. We can save money by, you know, setting the air conditioning set point much higher than usual. Um, and we have been telling people, yeah, that's just going to save you some money, but you're really endangering what special collections you have in that building. And dealing with a mold outbreak is going to be way more expensive than keeping your environment set at a reasonable point. Um, so I think if you're in an institution where people are proposing that, you, you, you need to at least try to make that argument. Um, mold remediation can be enormously expensive. And once you have mold in your building and your collections, you're always going to have to be worried about it in the future. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through kind of a few years of, of uh, strategies for dealing with this relative humidity issue that I have. Um, this was the cheapest and um, the one that I was able to get, um, you know, implemented the quickest as well. So I just went to the hardware store, I bought a bunch of box fans and I put them on those timers that you get for, you know, vacation timers if you're leaving your house and you want to have a couple of lights yeah. on and off or you have uh, holiday lights on that you want on a schedule. Um, very out of the box solution. So these are set up just to keep the air moving. And they're also great um, long term now that I have other strategies in place, which I'll talk about, just to have these stashed away in case we have um, a small or large water event. So now I've got a bunch of box fans in reserve. Um, this was my next strategy. Um, I was able to convince um, people to buy $400 portable dehumidifier. Um, I was very concerned about um, making sure that it could be drained because I didn't want to, A, have to worry about managing, um, emptying that full bucket, knowing I'm a one person shop, that was gonna be me going in on the weekends and holidays to deal with that. Um, and also I um, was worried about the peaks and valleys that I would create if the unit automatically shut off because the bucket was full 
on a Saturday and I got there on a Monday, I was going to, you know, see that RH go up again in the meantime. Um, so this was my portable dehumidifier unit. This is um, a little bit nicer than the kinds that you buy at Home Depot. It's in designed for industrial use, so it's a little bit more durable um, and more energy efficient. It is super loud, though. So I found myself having to shut it off if I had a patron appointment or a class coming into the reading room, or I, even if I needed to take a phone call. I had to shut it off because it was so there was so much white noise from it. So a um, couple other points about this. Uh, the, the photo on the right where you can see the whole machine, you'll notice that I kind of jerry-rigged a little baffle there on the top because the only place to put it in the room where we could set up the, the, the drain was directly below the indicator panel for the HVAC on the wall above. So um, I didn't want um, the exhaust from this unit tripping and, and creating a, a false reading for the HVAC system for the room. Um, also, and then on the left, you can see that small flexible drain hose going into the wall. I was able to um, have our physical plant team thread this through the wall and drain into an adjacent area. Um, this was a better solution, but definitely not perfect. Um, this unit started getting old a couple years after I had it, and then I walked in one day and found a nice puddle of water on the floor. And um, I wasn't quite sure how long it had been there because it had been a couple days since I'd been in the space. And so um, we brought in a wet dry vac and the box fans came back out to try to bring to dry out that carpet so we didn't have mold in the carpet um, and also bring that RH back down. Um, with this history, I was able to eventually advocate for a hardwired dehumidifier unit that's actually embedded in the ceiling above my reading room. So this is so much better. Um, it was not cheap. Uh, this unit was about, I think it was about $3,500 for the actual unit. Um, but this is an industrial unit um, that's that it also uh, is more energy efficient than some of the other models that you can buy. So um, it took a couple years of advocating and realizing that, you know, the, the RH was somewhat better with the Band-Aid solutions that I had before, but I was able to get this unit. Um, but still, you know, the, I guess uh, the main message I wanted to give you is um, that this requires, definitely still requires regular, regular monitoring. So in addition to that hardwired dehumidifier unit, I have a separate data logger in the room so that I can compare the readings from one to another and make sure that, um, that I'm, what I'm seeing on the display for that dehumidifier is actually accurate. Um, it also requires regular, regular monitoring because um, whenever there's a minor power event, it trips the circuit. So then I have to call a physical plant to have, um, to have the unit turned back on. So without my kind of fly in the ointment um, uh, advocacy, um, this would be something that wouldn't be anyone's top priority except for me. Um, so I want to segue into a uh, couple solutions I've come up with for enclosed storage areas. Um, this is uh, the closet. Uh, this is a door leading to a closet that I use as a storage area. And I actually had um, ventilation grates cut into the door at the top and the bottom so that the, um, the dehumidification happening in the main part of the room reached the collections that were stored in that closet. So that seems to have been working pretty well. Okay, sorry, my slides are a little out of order. Um, back to dehumidifiers and still needing close monitoring. Um, uh, I wanna make a pitch also for water alarms for portable units. If you have a small dehumidifier sitting on the floor in your space, um, a water alarm 
can really um, provide an extra level of monitoring in case of a leakage. Um, they are fairly inexpensive. I think you can get them um, from a bunch of different suppliers for maybe 50 bucks. Um, and they sound similar to a um, smoke detector. So they set off a really high pitched sound um, and they work, they work really well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, advocacy with building managers. Um, I referenced um, needing to go and have a conversation about um, making sure that my space had constant temperature and, and humidity control rather than the energy efficient settings for the rest of the building. Um, there is definitely a lot of education involved with uh, a larger team of people who are extremely capable and um, do a great job with managing our campus in general, but didn't have the specialized knowledge about collections that I was able to um, educate them about. Um, uh, one other thing about data loggers is um, they do have a lifespan. You want to make sure that um, that what that you can either replace the cheap hardware store variety on a regular basis or that you send out your data loggers for recalibration. Um, and this is something I'm grappling with now because the PEM data loggers that I bought probably about eight years ago now, the readings are way out of whack, but it costs $150 each to have them recalibrated. So now I'm going back to square one and thinking about maybe going, going with a different model that's less expensive um, and just replacing them on a regular basis. Okay, a couple more examples here of, of uh, enclosed storage and display areas. I bet a lot of us have these um, storage units that where we have like glassed in um, shelving like this, or even your run of the mill display case that you might have in your historical society or a museum. Um, you're creating, you have a little um, enclosed space um, with the potential to create a microclimate, not a lot of ventilation often in these spaces. Um, and with the still air and um, ambient temperature and relative humidity in your area, um, there's a, maybe even a higher risk for a mold outbreak to occur in these enclosed spaces. Um, so a couple of options here to try to help with that situation. Um, you can get packs of desiccant pretty inexpensively. You can either get um, individual packs um, like, the, like the picture on the left that are one time use only and um, put them maybe one on each shelf, hide them in the back behind your collections items if you don't want them to show. Or you can get a canister type with, um, with a separate silica product, desiccant product that you can recondition. So um, it changes color over time. It lets you know when it's time to remove it and recondition it by either baking it in the oven or microwaving it. I haven't, I don't have experience with this type personally. So if anyone has questions about that, that hopefully somebody else who's joining us today can, can um, offer some thoughts about that. Um, okay, and uh, one other thought that I've had about um, storage is um, to just avoid containers that are completely sealed. So um, I stay away from plastic totes, first of all. I stay away from um, the, you can get, I think they're called coroplast, correct me if I'm wrong. It's like a plastic um, material that's corrugated like cardboard, but it's a plastic base. You can get those in various sizes from archival suppliers. And they are water resistant. They do a good job of keeping water out, but they do create a really tight seal within, um, within their container space. So because I already know that I am dealing with high RH and in many of my storage areas, I decided not to use those. Um, the picture on the left is an example of a, um, a, a, a carton of manuscripts that um, 
is something that is restricted for a period of time based on the arrangement with the, the transferring body within Champlain College. And I've seen other repositories that will seal off boxes like this with packing tape or even do that, that plastic shrink wrap over them so that they can guarantee that no one's been inside and tampered with those materials. Um, but I'm really concerned about creating a microclimate. So I'm using a, just a regular cardboard, acid-free cardboard carton that I know is going to be a little bit more breathable. Um, I have those hand holds enabled in the box for two reasons, both for ease of access and transport and also because it creates a little bit more airflow. Yeah. Michelle? Yeah, Erica, I can, I can add this too. I think you're making the right choice there to stay with cardboard because um, I remember from a fire um, mitigation workshop that I participated in, oh, it's gotta be 10 or 15 years ago, but I never forgot it. They did a simulation of a fire and we literally, this was down in Rockville, Maryland at the National Fire Safety, Safety Institute, I think it's called down there in Maryland. And um, they did this for AIC, the American Institute for Conservation. And they did a mock-up of a fire uh, inside a big hangar kind of building. And they encouraged all of us museum professionals to bring objects in various storage containers like this and like plastic containers, you know, all kinds of things, and put them in this fake building that they put together. And then they burned the fake building for us inside the hangar that we were in. And it was quite shocking <laughs> to realize that in a fire, plastic containers are going to shrink. And any documents or textiles or anything else that you have inside a plastic container, when it comes to fire, at least it's going to be, I mean, think like shrink wrapped, but a thousand times thicker, you know? And yeah, then when the, let's say the firemen arrive and they're dousing everything in sight with water, these corrugated paper document or uh, boxes and storage units really react quite well and hold up for quite a long time during the rescue process. So I tell you, I never forgot that. Like I say, this was maybe 15 years ago. So I just want to give you kudos. I think you're absolutely doing the right thing for staying with cardboard containers. Thank you. So I just want to um, do a time check, check in with the other hosts here. I know that we're running close to the end of our workshop time and we haven't had a chance for questions. I do have maybe uh, three to five minutes more in my presentation. What do we, um, but I'm happy to move on to questions um, if we would prefer to do that, knowing that we're short on time. I say, please keep going, Erica. Okay, sounds good. Um, so we've already mentioned, uh, Rachel and Carolyn already mentioned um, strategy, strategies or the need to strategize for materials coming into your collection. And I wanna share with you a case study about that um, and what, so what I have done. So what you're looking at is uh, an open, a, a closet. So this is my quarantine closet. So I have one space set aside for incoming things um, that I want to monitor um, for mold or pests before I introduce them into another collections area and start processing them and potentially releasing the, the mold or the pests into the larger collections environment. So um, this is just a small sample of a huge a uh, trove of filing cabinets that are in that were in another building on the Champlain College campus. So this was a historic building on our campus that um, had been occupied as an office for several different departments for about 30 years. And what they had done with all of their old files is put them in filing cabinets in the basement of this building. And this is a perennially wet basement. Um, prior to my arrival, apparently, anecdotally, I've heard that there were a couple of minor floods in this basement. 
Um, so when I arrived on the scene, somebody said, oh, you should go check out this basement because it's got 30 filing cabinets full of all these old records. And um, they're no longer in use. Uh, and they might be great to add to the archives. So um, I walked over, walked downstairs and into this basement and immediately could smell mildew and mold in the air. Did um, a, a quick test check, opening some file drawers to, to kind of get a sense of whether this was stuff I was at all interested in to begin with. And then kind of sat on it for a while until I figured out what my strategy was going to be because I was worried about you know what was I going to be introducing to my collection particularly with bringing in such a huge quantity of photographs and and papers um, it was going to add maybe a third of the size of my collection could I safely um, keep them long term could I safely process them could I um, allow patrons to look at them safely? Um, was I going to be um, committing myself to something really expensive in the long run as far as possible mold remediation was concerned? Um, so what I ended up doing was I hired um, MJ Davis, uh, another paper conservator in Vermont. She's in the Northeast Kingdom. And she and I did a site visit, so to speak, to this basement. We suited up in Tyvek with respirators. And we went in and we had a, we did a more concentrated look and talked about strategies. So it turns out in my case, I was pretty lucky in that everything that I wanted was enclosed within a filing cabinet. So in that sheltered items from the worst of the humidity and most of the photographs in, in this group of material had already been sleeved in plastic so that while that might not be the best strategy long-term in ideal museum and archives collections, it actually worked to my advantage here because um, it protected them from mold growing directly on the surface and it allowed me to have something I could easily clean off. So working with MJ, we came up with a game plan. She did a little training um, and then that was about five years ago and um, so as I have time and space, I have been transferring file drawers out of that basement, um, obviously prioritizing the materials I was most interested in. And then they sit in this closet for a month or so, and then I take a look at them. Part of our strategy for the long term also is that this, this group of materials will always be segregated by itself. Um, and hopefully that will mean in a different storage room so that if they're, um, because I know that they're more susceptible to mold outbreaks in the future, I hopefully won't endanger other parts of the collection if I were to have a mold break with, outbreak with these items. Okay, so I think that's the end of my presentation. Um, I'm hopeful that you all have lots of questions. I'm going to stop my screen share and um, Eileen, maybe you could tell me how to make you the host again or if that's something you can do on your end. Yeah, so I reclaimed the host uh, and so we've got a couple questions from the chat. If you've got any other questions right now, probably the easiest thing because we have a lot of folks is to use the raise your hand feature and then hopefully we can go down the list. Um, so just a couple from the uh, chat. Lori had a question about dealing with mold on leather books. Um, so I don't know if Carolyn uh, might wanna address that one to start. Sure, um, so I see Rachel just jumped in and she's gonna say the same thing that I'm saying. Um, really, if you can work with a conservator or have someone come out and show you or your volunteers or staff how to safely do it, um, that's what I would recommend. Um, but basically you want, like I said, you want to make sure that the materials, so the book and the leather and any other binding materials are really dry because if it's at all damp, you're just going to be rubbing the mold spores deeper into the, into the leather or whatever surface or a surface that they're on. Um, and then Aspirations. So using 
a controlled amount of suction from a vacuum cleaner with a special attachment to lift the mold spores away from the leather or the paper. Um, and there are different attachment tools that are better than others for certain types of mold or objects. Um, sometimes what we recommend, and this is what I did in a workshop for a historical society here that had a large mold outbreak, um, is you can vacuum through a polyester window screen so that you're not going to be sucking up any um, deteriorated leather, for example, or paper. Um, you want to make sure you're not doing damage to the objects you're trying to remove the mold from. Um, so there are safe ways to treat it, but again, I just want to emphasize that there's really no point or there's not a lot of point in doing the mold remediation if those books are going right back into the same storage environment. Okay. Uh, because that mold's just going to come right back the next time the humidity goes goes up. Can I just um, just ask uh, specifically? So yeah, that that's great. I'm sort of a one person show. I run. I curate a small collection in Gilmanton. Um, and so I empty the dehumidifier and run the fans and keep things going. Um, and the mold is mostly on, on the bookshelves. And of course, for people to access the books, you know, they're all stacked together. So it was really great to see the desiccant mm -hmm. option. Um, but what is the best way for me to dry the book out first? Unfortunately, I lost power and I had to log back in and I think I may have missed that, but do I take the books out and lay them in a bright spot um, or lay them in the least humid spot in the museum? I mean, you know, what, what's the best way to dry them out before I vacuum them? So those are both good tactics. You want to make sure that they're safe, secure. You know, one's going to walk off with them or if you're doing it. Yeah, we have an alarm system and I'm the only one who goes in and out of the museum other and than our officers. Recommend um, if you're doing any mold remediation treatment yourself that you do it outside because otherwise you're going to just be loosening up those mold spores and putting them right back into your building. Um, so, so is it so I would take a table outside and lay the books out in the sun? Or you could let them dry. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what I would probably recommend is if you can do it is to set them up, I don't know if I can show you with this, um, so that they're fanned and they're supported. Oh, okay, yep, great. A little bit of air circulation. Um, if you have a dry space in your building, this, this is sort of where, um, to get back to what Erica and Michelle are saying about plastic bins, um, you know, sometimes when I take in a moldy collection of books, especially, I start off by putting them in a plastic bin um, but I don't put the lid on. I put you contain um, it. a piece of fabric um, over top that can let the moisture out. Um, I did kind of a fun experiment where I took in some books that had mold damage that had been in a very damp house and I put my RH monitor in there and sure enough, it shot right up to 70. Yep. Um, so another way to do that a little bit safely, more safe, is to, to put them in a, even a cardboard box um, and, and fan them and let them stay in a drier environment. Okay. Uh, you know, whether or not it's reasonable to, to do that outside, I mean, you have to stay out there with them, is what I re would recommend. It has to be not a windy day or a humid day. Right. Um, that's always a challenge when scheduling these types of workshops, um, is, is the weather is really a key factor. Um, and you want to make sure that you're wearing a mask and gloves. Um, I would recommend changing your clothes, um, putting those clothes in the washing machine when you get home. Um, you know, and that's something that I, I'm happy to provide some more specific guidance on um, when you're ready to, to do it. Okay. But that's sort of the, the gist of it. But again, you know, if it's going back, it sounds like now you are controlling the humidity um, as best you can. And I think you'd also ask like, how much does a dehumidifier help? Um, it's really important when you're trying to decide what dehumidifier to purchase to look at what square footage it supposedly works in. And I would say my experience is that they're hardly ever um, as advertised. I don't know if others have found that, but I, I, I always go up in size. Yeah. Um, my, my studio space is a big 1,000 square foot space and my home is about the same. So I basically buy the biggest capacity possible um, and keep them running continuously and, and draining. And they make a huge difference. I mean, 
to go back to my home again. Like I, I did not um, turn it on last night because I forgot. Um, and I went downstairs and it was 85% humidity. Oh, yeah, especially now. Yeah, and, and, and you know, after an hour of running, I'd gotten it down to 58. So they make a big difference. And that's what you don't want to do is have those big swings, but right. you know, that's sometimes the reality of the situation. Um, if your power goes out, um, that can be an issue. You know, so there are all these things to, to be aware of, but I think, you know, most of us will tell you it's better most of the time to do something instead of nothing. And, you know, realistically, are we all going to be able to install um, hardwired systems? Probably not. Um, you know, so you just have to do the best you can and, and try to monitor what the conditions are. But they, they make a huge difference Thank when you. they're working. So it looks like, um, Leslie, you've had your hand raised. I'm not sure if you still have a question or not. If you want to unmute and ask anything, you can. I, I raised my hand earlier uh, uh, for the first question we had. But, so no, I don't have my hand. Okay. Unraise it. <laughs> OK. Uh, so the next question comes from Will in the chat for Erica about fans and uh, whether there's a risk of distributing spores by using those. Well, uh, that's a really good question. I mean, as we've heard, the spores are present everywhere. Um, before, I would say before turning on the fans or investing in them, make sure that you don't have a major mold bloom in your space or that you have collections that have active mold um, so that you're not exacerbating um, and making things airborne any more than they already are. Um, my goal with the, the fans is in a space where um, I, I didn't have any evidence of active mold, that, that moving the air around was going to help prevent one. All right, any other questions? All right. All right, well, it looks like nobody else uh, has a question. So uh, again, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you especially to Erica, Rachel, and Carolyn uh, for their presentation. Uh, we will again be sending you guys a link, uh, anybody who's registered a link with a recording for this, um, probably later today if everything works out right. Uh, and please do visit the CCCA website link that was provided in the beginning in the chat. And I don't know if anybody, uh, Darlene, I think, did you want to wrap up at all with uh, anything for CCCA? Sure, I'd just like to say again, as Eileen had just mentioned to um, please check out our website, hit the subscribe button at the end of whatever page you're on to get onto our list for advanced notices and um, events. And if you, well, I'll say in a couple of weeks, we will definitely have the membership information up. And if you check out the membership information and feel that you qualify for the professional affiliate level, then please be sure to check out the dates for our conversations with colleagues. Um, we are hoping that first one will be in July at the end of this month, actually. And, um, you know, if all goes well with COVID and the economy is open, we should be able to, to do that because we are in a state park. So we are out in a, a public area where we can abide by the six foot social distancing. And other than that, thank you so much for joining us for this inaugural workshop. And we hope that we've provided you with you know, either a refresher to information you already know or some answers to questions that you have. And as Eileen has said, we will, we will be providing the link for this recording so you'll have it for future reference. So thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.